Yesterday we concluded with my uh, quotation from Wilmus Chehi, our beloved founder, Uncle Wilmus as we referred to him. And this morning I want to start off in this same way with an invitation extended to me from Uncle Wilmus and then the story that followed after it. So one day in Muncie Terrace's I think it was about my third year, maybe my fourth. Wilmus Chehi, Uncle Wilmus, said to me, Son, let's take a walk. And he put his arm around me and we walked around the, the paths around Muncie Terraces near Williamsport, Pennsylvania. A walk in which Wilmus asked me all about my life my church, my family, my trombone playing, singing. He asked particularly about my walk with Jesus, my trust in Christ. And then the major points came up. Now, son, he said to me, will you spend time with young Reggie Halperin? Reggie Halperin was from New Jersey. 15 years old, a cello student. He became quite renowned at Shehi very quickly because at 15 years old he could grow a beard in one day, pretty much. But he was quite a troubled young man, came from a difficult home. But that summer we saw Reggie turn to Jesus and become an ardent follower of Christ. Though to be honest, his cello playing didn't improve much because he wasn't very disciplined about that. And the second point Uncle Wilmus had for me was, again, he hugged me tight with his arm around my shoulder and he said, now Wesley, you certainly would want to get your hair cut for dear old Uncle Wilmus, wouldn't you? And I did. But as you see, it's grown back. <laughs> if he were here today, he'd take me on a walk and say, don't you want to get a haircut? That was a walk that I still think about after all these years. We come now to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. As our text for this morning, and it really is the thematic heart of this Colossian letter. And it uses this very same metaphor of walking, even in similar ways to what I've just described with Wilmus Chehi, our founder. Let's read the passage, and then I'll try to draw out some of its most important truths, I think, that we can apply for you and me today. Colossians 2, 6 to 15, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one, there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world, rather in accordance with Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over every ruler and authority, and in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision performed without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, and when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. 
The thematic statement for the whole of Colossians is this imperative in verse 6 that those who claim Christ are actually to begin to walk in Christ or to continue in all that it means to keep walking in him. Do you see that in verse 6? Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So what does this language of walking mean? It is the Greek imperative peripatete or from peripateo from which we derive our English idea of perimeter. You hear that in the word peripateo, around which you traverse or navigate or move the perimeter. And so it clearly suggests in New Testament usage the total full circumference of your life. This is an ongoing relationship with Jesus that is entirely holistic. A little clearer? Thank you. <laughs> an ongoing relationship with Jesus that is the whole of life, holistic, encompassing virtually everything. Peri pateo, the full circumference walking with Jesus. Young women, young men, if you are walking in Christ, hear this, if you are walking in Christ, your relationship with Jesus touches upon everything, not just certain and restricted compartments comes to bear upon your closest relationships, your aspirations and your dreams, your involvement in your community, culture, and school life, your thought life, your behavior, and yes, of course, your music making. Not compartmentalization, boxing Jesus up to fit into restricted shelves of your life. I find this very prevalent amongst Christians generally, but particularly amongst young Christians, young people, boxing Jesus up where you can control him. No perimeter walking means the whole of your life is affected by your faith in Christ. <clears throat> but to do justice to the text, we must see that this imperative is prefaced by a transitional clause in which the Apostle Paul almost conditions it, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him, as you see in verse 6 again. What does the Apostle have in mind in introducing this theme in this transitional, quasi-conditional way, with such a stress on what it meant to these young Christians of Colossians, the Colossian letter, Colossae, to have received Christ. There are probably two ways to understand this. One of them is to understand that it probably harkens back to Paul's discussion of the mystery of Christ. Back in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it's on the screen for you there, or you can also look at it in your own Bible. It's also referenced in chapter 2, verse 2. But here in 1, 26, 27, that is the mystery that has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is, the mystery that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. This is what receiving Christ is about. It is the mystery of Christ actually indwelling you. That is the essence of being a follower of Jesus. I sat at a table and they are all disciples, Matthew John, Andrew, a 
follower of Jesus means you have Jesus dwelling within. Being a Christ follower is not simply about professed beliefs or accord with both rational or even supernatural doctrines. It is about the wonderful and exhilarating mystery of Christ coming into you. It is experiential. Christ in you, says the text. Christ living out his life through you, through your personality, your style, your unique demonstration of the image of God that is coming through you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is a supernatural experience and reality, and that's why Paul calls it a mystery. But there is another stress that is clearly suggested in the text back in chapter 2, again, verse 6, that informs what receiving Christ means in Pauline language. He says specifically, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord. Ton Kurian, the Lord, so hugely significant throughout the New Testament for our understanding of and our approach to this Jesus whom we receive. Ton Christon Jesun Ton Kurian, literally the Christ Jesus, the Lord. With such a stress that one of the preeminent premier New Testament scholars in the world today, his name is Douglas Moo, translates it just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. Young men, young women, to walk in Christ means that you walk in step with one who is ton kurian, the Lord. Douglas Moo again puts it this way. The polemical context in which Paul writes justifies our seeing in this language an exclusive emphasis typical of the letter of the Colossians as a whole. Let Christ and no other, let Christ and no other, for he is Lord. Establish your values, guide your thinking, direct your conduct. To which I would add, let Christ and no other, because he is Lord. Distinguish your direction, fix your affections, stimulate your dreams, stretch your horizons and set your boundaries wide. Determine whether you marry and who you marry. And yes, of course, infill your music your art, your creativity, your imagination, your passion, because Christ is ton kurian, the Lord. Now, there's one last determinant that is in Paul's mind, certainly, as to what walking in Christ means. As in verse 7, back chapter 2, verse 7, Look at it closely in your Bible or here on the screen. He puts it in terms of having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, established in the faith. And it is this notion of the faith, which is the entire focus of the rest of this passage. Not your faith, doesn't say that, some versions translate it that way, but they're, humbly I say, they're just wrong. <laughs> it is te piste, the faith. Because the faith, meaning the Christian faith in terms of the content of what one believes rather than the act of believing, is at odds 
with what might have been the whole reason for this letter to the Colossians. It is clear that the letter to the Colossians is addressing what some refer to as the Colossian heresy, and others less caustically as the threat of false teaching to which Christians living in Colossae were susceptible. Indications and demarcations of this heresy or false teaching spring up all through this letter, but here in the passage we are looking at, reviewing this morning, is one of the clearest examples as we come to in verse 8. Look at your Bible, read it with me on the screen, verse 8. See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles, rather than in accordance with Christ. Now there is some debate as to what the Colossian heresy or false teaching actually was in particulars, but all of the New Testament scholars Virtually all of them agree now that it was more than likely some brand of what we should call serious syncretism. Can anyone tell me what syncretism is? Any ideas out there? What do we mean when you use a lofty theological word like syncretism? Yeah, Haley. Yeah, mixing Christian teaching up with other pagan, uh, other cultural ideas. It is basically, very good, Ailey, write a hymn about this. <laughs> it is the mixing together of two or more religious or and even philosophical stances, beliefs, traditions, or cultural affectations. Putting them together. Mixing them up, saying it's all one. And here in Colossae, it was likely the blending together of what is called Phrygian folk beliefs and a version of folk Judaism. Some scholars also include early forms of Gnosticism with some intermixing of watered down Christianity. And I want to be clear in saying, young women, young men, staff, counselors, faculty, that I personally see serious and dangerous syncretism as one of the major challenges to the church and its mission in the world today, and especially for the new generation of Christians that is you sitting here this morning. A dangerous, serious blending that amounts to watering down Christian truth rather than speaking of it directly. Oh, not usually in the most blatant modes or forms like attempts at meshing Buddhism and Christ or Islam and Christianity or Hinduism and Christian ethics, but what in what is perhaps the more subtle and sinister meshing of Westernisms with what is so evidently nothing but watered down Christianity, with a whole host of idolatries in their wake that come in the form of health and wealth versions of the gospel that belittle the Bible's emphasis on God's heart for the poor and the oppressed and the widows and the children. Western consumptive practices that excuse the rich from the warnings of Jesus. Western religious consumerism that turns faith into self-help therapy and self-promotion. And sexual libertarianism that resorts to and thus distorts the Bible. I challenge you, young men and women, don't settle for watered-down Christianity 
It has no power. It has no truth. It has no lasting value. Don't even entertain it. Don't cave into it. Don't mix your Christianity up with all that's around you. Be true to what the Bible says. Because what is most important for us today is to understand that the Apostle Paul sees that as inimical, totally at odds with, against the faith, the real faith. Because the faith is about what is true as opposed to what is false. You cannot mesh truth with error and call it the faith, the faith, as determined in Christ. It thereby loses all semblance of what can be called Christian, Christian. And what is Paul's antidote to this synchristic deception? He holds forth the real Jesus. He holds forth the real Jesus as the central truth of the faith, which is the entirety of verses 9 to 15 here in Colossians chapter 2. Christ is the fullness of deity in bodily form, verse 9. Christ is the one who makes you complete, Verse 10, Christ is the head over all rule and authority. Verse 10 as well, Christ is the one who circumcises your heart, not just your flesh. Verse 11, Christ is the one you join in baptism. Verse 12, Christ is the one who makes you spiritually and eternally alive through the forgiveness of sin. Verse 13, Christ is the one who nails your sin, your debt, to the cross, Christ is the one who has disarmed the rulers and authorities and triumphs over them because of the cross. Verse 15. Young women, young men, walking in Christ means that which is rooted and built upon and established in the truth, which is what Paul means when he uses that phrase, in the faith. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in the faith. You cannot mesh in a synchristic way truth and falsehood and call it the Christ way. And so I conclude with a wonderful statement from my dear, first of all, mentor, spiritual guide, and then he turned into my friend and colleague, and, and then he became even more highly esteemed in me in all of my years at Chehi to have the privilege of knowing Dr. Samuel Shu. We were discussing that wonderful promise of Jesus in John 8, verse 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this is what Dr. Shu said. Too many people want the purported freedom of self-assessed and self-determined truth without engaging in the hard work of knowing the truth. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. 
So let's pray a prayer overflowing with gratitude. The truth through Jesus. Don't mesh it with lies, philosophies, and deceptions that float all around you in our world. Keep it pure. We thank you, Lord, with great gratitude for your word, for its truth, its power. Thank you for people like Wilmus Chahi who took that walk with me and so has influenced my walk with Jesus ever since. Thank you for Sam Shu, who reminds us that it's not about self-assessed or self-determined truth. It is about knowing the truth in the person of Jesus Christ. Pray for each student as they go through this day. They will overflow with gratitude because of Christ in them, the hope of glory. Amen.